So hello and welcome. I am a little bit uh, like a giddy schoolgirl, a little bit overexcited for this conversation. But anyway, this is one of my 60 conversations and I am speaking today with the lovely Jamie Smart, who was um, gracious enough to accept my invitation to one of these conversations. And although he may not know me very well, he has been a huge catalyst in my journey. Jamie was actually the person that I first heard speaking about the principles and had a huge insight which totally changed my entire life my family's entire life everything so it's not an understatement to you know to, to say you have had a huge impact on me and my family so thank you very much for that <laughs> well you're so welcome and that's great to hear because my passion is transformation like it's what I'm personally it's what I'm fascinated by it's what I love uh sharing with other people it's what i love teaching other people how to bring about in their clients lives and in their life loved ones lives so it's always a huge pleasure to hear how i've played some small part in helping uh someone wake up to you know the truth of who we are and how our experience is created it's really really wonderful to hear yeah yeah, so yeah, a, a huge thank you for that. And you know, the whole YouTube channel and all of this, it's it's all Jamie's fault. If you want to blame <laughs> me, it's all Jamie's fault. <laughs> um, so I would really, really love to hear, you know, what's new and fresh for you right now? Because I just think this this conversation, like I can see that was a pivotal moment for me when I heard what you said and something mm -hmm. fundamentally shifted in me. And I have never fully gone back to the person I was before, but equally, you know, I've come a long way in those years. Mm -hmm. So what's new and fresh and showing up for you right now? Well, I'll tell you, I'll, I'll tell you, and you may go, Jamie, that's the same stuff you've been saying for you. <laughs> I remember, I remember, uh, I, Back in 2011, I ran a retreat in St. Lucia and I was there for, I don't know, a week or something. We had like nine clients flew out there and it was absolutely beautiful. And I really got impacted myself just by being there and sharing what I was seeing and listening to Sid and that sort of thing. And when I came back, I was talking to one of my friends and he said, how was it? And I was like, oh, it's great. I see everything differently. I see it so much more deeply, so much more clearly. He's like, oh, wow, like what? And I said something and he's like, you've been saying that for years. And I'm like, okay, okay. <laughs> so, so you may have that experience, but like what's really, really striking me right now is like I, I as you know i'm i'm a, a big fan of sid bank's work i listen to his recordings regularly i i most days i transcribe his work and and reflect on it and i was was listening to uh one of his recordings called shonagan i think it's called and uh, in that, he says, uh, you realize there's nothing to do to find your happiness. Just live. Uh, because you are a microscopic part of the whole. And wh what I heard in that, even more deeply, is it's almost like, and th this is kind of very personal in how I'm going to describe it. So this is what it's like for me. What it's like for me is there are two ways of living. And one way of living is kind of what we might call the ego's way or the, the personality's way. And, the, and that comes with its own logic of what you need to do in order to be happy and to achieve. And it comes with its own guidance system and all that sort of stuff. And for all of us, to some extent or another, that's got quite a track record, like it's what we're used to. And then there's this other way of navigating and operating. And it starts from the premise that uh, there's nothing you need to do to find your happiness. It's already there within you. And that goes for happiness, security, peace of mind, well-being. Mm -hmm. And that we live in a spiritual world. 
that we live in a spiritual world and that there's a logic and wisdom of that world too. And it's a very different logic. It's a source of guidance and wisdom and 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 you can you can you can play by the rules of whichever world you like, but you're not gonna get the guidance, the navigation, the the what my dear, dear friends and colleagues and mentors, Chip and Jan Chipman call the magic carpet ride of uh, kind of surrendering to the truth of who we are and what we've got going for us and allowing ourselves to be guided. So I'm just seeing that more and more and more deeply and seeing that for me anyway, Deborah, in each moment, I've got the opportunity to either go with my old ideas about how the world works and what you need to do in order to get shit done and all that sort of stuff. Or I can go, well, actually, no, I'm I'm going to start from the premise of there's nothing to do to find your happiness. And so what makes sense now? <laughs> and uh, it's just an entirely different premise. And it's uh, certainly the like. I'm I'm putting words on it to try and give you a sense of the feeling of something. But the other thing, the other thing that is just striking me afresh, Sid Sid often says words to the effect of it's a spiritual world. You have to believe it's a spiritual world. And Over the years, you know, I hear him say that and I'm kind of like, yeah, 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 yeah. No, I get it. <laughs> but but, but it, with as each as each year passes, I'm kind of with everything he says, I'm kind of like, oh, yeah, he means literally. He's not just being poetic or using a figure of speech or he mean, he's being very, very literal. He's choosing his words specifically and literally and uh and there are implications to that. So that's what's that's what's hitting me at the moment in terms of the principles, and then in terms of my work, I'm I've become clearer and clearer and clearer that what I love doing is teaching coaches and therapists and change workers how to have a transformational impact. That's that's the stuff I'm fascinated with and the yeah. stuff I love teaching. So I'm kind of doubling down on that and just going, okay, that's what I'm putting all my focus and energy into is uh, uh, showing people how do you actually have a big impact with these principles? How do you, how do you, you know, leverage your understanding of the principles and your understanding of what it is to be a person to have a profound and transformational impact in another person's life? So that's the stuff that I'm up to at the moment. Wow. Yeah. I love that. I love that. And definitely that's that's my area of interest too like doing that for people and seeing mm -hmm. having had my experience kind of knowing the possibility knowing what what is on offer for people if they hear something it's such an honor to to be able to speak to someone in such a way and and see that same excitement that same <laughs> the possibility that opens from from there it's really cool, isn't it? And I, it feels what certainly for me anyway, Deborah, it feels like a like just such a gift. It's like it's like I I I've done enough of this work that I know I can rely on it. I know that that capacity for insight and realization is there in everyone of it so i know i can rely on it and i know how to kind of steer in that direction but i never know when it's going to show up or how it's going to show up and i'm always surprised and delighted i'm always like well the, well there it is again holy moly i never <laughs> expected that and uh it, it's great fun i find it really really fun to do that work 
and what people see as well you know what people actually yeah. come out and and you know how sometimes when you're with someone you can see something you, you, you can say oh gosh yeah if you would see this that would change and then they see something entirely different <laughs> oh well now here's the funny thing Deborah. for me when i'm working with someone I have no idea <laughs> what it would help them to see, but I'm really clear on that. So I know, I don't know what it is that they're going to see that's going to help them out. And so it's, it's always surprising and, mm. and cool when they see something, I'm like, Oh, wow. It's got, almost got that kind of, you know, there it is in the nick of time again. And, and I just love it. It's, it's a really, you know, the, one of the things I love about it is, it's such a fun way to work because it allows you to be right at the edge of your, you know, ability level and everything like that. And, and you're, as I see it anyway, you're almost kind of collaborating or co-creating with life and something new emerges. It's ever so cool. Yeah, it's brilliant. Um, I heard something you think that uh, it was actually Ankus Jane. I heard him say something, um, uh, he, he was addressing a room, I think it might it might have been the, the recording um, from Viva, I don't know. But anyway, he was saying something and, and he sort of said, if if you just listen, you know, but don't don't. It's not me you're listening to. I'm not important, but listen and hear. And he said, you're very likely going to hear something really important for yourself that I am not even going to say. <laughs> mm. <laughs> and that that really impacted me. I was like. Yeah, that's exactly it. <laughs> oh, 100%. I think it's spot on, Deborah, because, you know, I was, I was having a chat with Jan Chipman, and she and I both love listening to Sid Banks. Mm. And we were talking about that. And she said, you know, I guess the thing I love about Sid is he makes it so easy for you to listen to your true identity. Mm. And it really struck me because I realized, yeah, that's exactly what Sid's doing. And it's also like it, in my work with clients, how I see it now is my job is almost to kind of be a mirror that allows them to catch a glimpse of who they really are. And what I found, Deborah, is, is like the more you're able to be in that place in you, the more you become that mirror that allows people to catch a glimpse of of who they really are and yeah it's 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 beautiful yeah it's beautiful and i i'm so glad you had that insight <laughs> yeah me too and interestingly that was exactly you know i i heard in something that you shared that my children weren't broken and neither was i and yet mm. I listened back and you did not say that. <laughs> but that's the art of it, isn't it? Like you, you, that, that source of insight and realization is so present in you that all it took was uh, for you to kind of fall awake for a moment and boom, there's exactly the insight that you needed. Mm. that's how reliable that's how persistent that's how creative that source of insight that source of realization is it's really cool like and it's it, the thing i love about it deborah is that's what we get to work with that that's there in everybody is that my beloved emma mcdevitt is doing work in schools at the moment working with like really disadvantaged kids kids that the school's worried about and all that sort of stuff but she goes in knowing that those kids have that in them too mm -hmm. not because she's met them before but because they've Absolutely. got that same capacity <laughs> Yeah, that's how it is. It, it's it, yeah, it, it's so beautiful, isn't it? It's, yeah, I love I love the the certainty that you speak about. Like this is there, this is there, this is yeah. there, and there is really something. You know, I'm I'm hearing that and hearing the certainty behind that. Um, I that is so powerful in itself because I think very often like 
our clients, they don't necessarily know that. And there's this whole, well, it's all right for you and all this kind of thing. But actually just showing I'm I'm really enjoying hearing in you. Yeah, this this thing that I'm working with, it's just yeah, it it's there. I'm working with something that exists, that's real, that's yeah. I mean, speaking to you as a coach, as a coach, you subcommunicate your uh take on the world your your understanding of life so if you uh have seen if you have realized something for yourself about who people are and what they've got going for them you'll subcommunicate that you'll let them know just like just like if you believe i don't know that that people are basically no good you'll subcommunicate that so you're you're to me, one of the most valuable things uh, a coach, a therapist, a change worker, a teacher can do is get crystal clear on what they, what do you know to be true? What have you realized for yourself that you know to be true, that you can hang your hat on, that you can take to the bank? Because you're going to subcommunicate that whether you mean to or not. <laughs> So like, like it's, it's gonna, that's gonna gonna show up. It's going to be in the room. <laughs> bingo, bingo. So, so it, it, it pays to just get clear on what that is. And to, to whatever degree you can iron out any wrinkles, it's worth, it's worth getting the iron out. So, uh, yeah. Cause I know after I had had my insight and then I kind of, I went home and I, I literally just went home and I was going to my kids, you're all right, you're all right. And so am I, everything's okay, everything's okay. And I think a few people thought I'd lost my marbles a little bit. And they were kind of like, you do remember everything that's happened, right? You right. do remember what's going on. You do remember remember this. And it's kind of like, and then I would just get really stuck and be like, yeah, yeah, but everything's okay. And I couldn't, at first, there was kind of no words on that and no way of sort of saying which was then kind of led me to to find Sid, listen to Sid, follow anything that you were doing that I could find to sort of say, how do I know that? What what yeah. is that? What is it that I know? <laughs> well, it's so interesting you say that. Like the 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 thing I know for sure is that the only thing that's going to make a difference to something someone is something that they realize for themselves from within. And so that's that as a as a as a coach, as a teacher, that's really helped me out. Like it's really it's really helped me to know the the best thing I've got going for me as a teacher is knowing what they've got going for them. Like that's <laughs> that that's like it. So it's like because all of a sudden there's a ton of stuff that isn't my job to do. Mm -hmm. I don't need to convince them of anything. All I need to do is make it easy for them to catch a glimpse of what's already there. And that's, that's, that's much easier than trying to convince people of the principles or whatever. So I, it's so funny, Anne, people often ask people who are, you know, already steeped in this understanding will go, Oh, do you find it difficult to work with people who've never heard of the principle? Yeah. <laughs> like, no, they're easy. They're yeah. the easiest because uh, it's, it's right there to be seen. Mm. it's right there to be seen it's there in everybody yeah that that is such such a beautiful gift to to see that and to know that and to know that and like you say there's no need then for manipulation or any of that because when when you're in a thing of somebody needs to know something you've got something riding on it you're you're yeah you're sure kind of manipulation going on there it's kind of yeah it's been it's been It's been a great relief to me to kind of know that when I'm working with an individual or with a group that that it's going to come from them. And it's a, a great relief to me for me to know that I I don't need to know what they need to see. Like I don't know what they need to see. In fact, Deborah, when people have those world-shaking insights, I'm almost always left with the uh, the sense that I I would never have thought yeah. that for them, but I'm glad they got it. Yeah, like yeah. So so it, like to me, that's part of the beauty of insight is that it's it's uh, 
it's context sensitive. It's really, it arrives in a way that's fully dialed into who they are and what they've got going on and what's important to them and all that stuff. And, and so it's like, for me, it's like the difference between, uh, well, it's not like the difference between anything. It's just the most, it's just the most, like every time I experience it for myself in, in my own life, it's the most wonderful gift. I'm like, oh God, yeah. Like, cause I forget, right? I look away from <laughs> No, don't say yeah, that. Yeah. <laughs> Surely then, I get, then I wake up, I'm like, oh yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. That's good. <laughs> hits you again i love it every time it, it hits you again that's you yeah see that <laughs> so fresh it's so it's fresh and it's surprising and it's a relief for me it's a relief because my other way of looking at the world is hard work <laughs> it looks really real mm. so uh it's a relief it's like oh yeah i love yeah at the beginning that that description of when you said that the two ways of looking looking at the world and kind of yeah we can do it this way the way that society yeah. it works or we can actually look at the allness of everything that the divinity this this magic that underpins it all whatever word you want to put on it it's like we can play there <laughs> yeah i love it you know and it's funny there's a there's a recording by sid banks that i love called mind and in insecurity and uh he says he he talks about it he says there are, there are two frames of reference i think he calls it he, he said yeah he goes uh uh he goes what you're doing in life everybody in the world creates a habit from birth it creates a behavioral pattern it creates a frame of reference a frame of reference which is in your head because your head, your brain is simply a little computer to hold all this information from birth to wherever you are now. And that's all you know, because you're seeing what I'm calling the first frame of reference. And he goes, that's you as you are now with all your hangups, all your problems, all your insecurities, all your behavioral patterns that you don't even know you have, all your troubles. That's you. He goes, but there's a second frame of reference. And the second frame of reference is beyond what your mind has computed now. And it's something which you've known all your life from birth. It's very simply, it's called wisdom. And, and to me, as Sid's saying, there are these two frames of reference. There's the first one, it's your, your game plan for life and everything <laughs> you know, and your logic. And then there's this second frame of reference. And what I hear in what he's saying is you can live from that second frame of reference. Mm -hmm. You can live from insight you can live from the knowing of your being and that's a very different uh way of living and um, just between us girls that's one i'm still trying to get my uh like to i'm i i have a great habit of trying to ride two horses with one bottom and i'm like i, I want i want to have my cake and eat it too. And so I'm in continually in the process of letting go and letting go and letting go more and more fully into that second frame of reference. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly as you're describing that, that that's kind of, that's the game I'm playing too. It's like, how do, how do we, you know, when these insecurities and fears, exactly as as Sid said, it's like they they show up. These things that we think we know show up as insecurities and fears. And it's like how playing the game of well, you know, one of the things I heard from Sid very early: you don't have to think that. And it's like as simple as that. It's kind of okay. So I'm thinking that I don't have to think that. And the minute we see that, it's like I don't have to think that. Something else shows up something else moves in into there it's like yeah mm. i can think so well i and and how it sounds to me is like for whatever reason when you remind yourself of that you have an insight mm. you know i on i think it was on that same recording i was just uh telling you about he at one point he says uh 
insecurity is a thought. The feeling of insecurity is a thought. And I, it's so funny, Deborah, because I look at the things that I feel insecure about. They don't look like thoughts. <laughs> Mine ain't neither. <laughs> they look really <laughs> practical yeah. and important. And like, I would be an idiot not to be worried about thinking them, thinking about, them, about them, them, taking care and, of them. And there's something, for me anyway, Deborah, there's something very kind of uh, confronting to even look at that and go, that's a thought. That's thought. That it it seems like it's got substance and reality and all this stuff to it. But it's made of thought. I'm not saying I shouldn't think it or anything like that, but mm, that's yeah. that's something to consider. Yeah. I think that really, really opens something up as well when when you can just have that conversation with yourself about something like that and and just and even if you just play with the idea so okay if I could see that as thought what would that change <laughs> you know and then yeah. I mean it the, for me anyway I kind of it's the getting hit with it that does something for me there's the 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 for me, Deborah, the only thing that ever really seems to help me out is insight. So I don't really, I don't even play with it very play with thoughts very much. I'm just like ready to be kind of um, hit with the straight. Like, because to me, I don't. When I'm talking about thought, I'm not talking about thinking and thoughts. I'm not. I'm, and like. When he says it's thought, it, it, what I hear is this is the infinite creative power, the infinite spiritual power behind life that you're using to create your perceptual reality right now. And it looks real and it sounds real and it feels real, but it's actually a spiritual power that's being created from within and projected outward. And I'm like, whoa, it doesn't look like that. It looks like a scary thing in the future. <laughs> it's like, whoa. Yeah, I like getting hit with it. I want it for me, the thing I found really helpful is to, uh, have my breath taken away by it to be like, oh, oh yeah. Like to really, yeah. Another thing he said in that same recording, he says right at the beginning of it, if I'm remembering correctly, he says, uh, oh, I can't find it, but uh, he says something like, you have to re this is back to the first frame of reference, second frame of reference thing, he said, it's about realizing you don't know as much as you think you know. Well, I always think I know as much as I think I know. <laughs> like I, I'm like I, 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 I have the habit of very having a very high opinion of what I think I know, and then I have to wake up. Oh, like oh yeah, I don't know. I don't know nearly as much as I think I know, and it's uh, that kind of throws me back into the world of possibility, the world of. Oh, what else might be going on here? And when you look at that as the frames of reference, we have spent so long um, bigging up and bowing down to our intellect and what we know and kind of making yeah. it a big thing of this intellect. And it's not, you know, none of this is, our intellect is great. You know, I have, I, I, I love it and all that, but it is in this 
arena, like you say, when we're stepping into this second frame of reference and and living that way, it's kind of like, yeah, we've we've got to sort of we've got to say, yeah, intellect great, but that's just what I think I know, and <laughs> I let yeah. let that not be this amazing thing that we've made it into in one sense. Well, it's so interesting, Deborah. There's this uh, thing that Sid says a lot. He talks about the ego being an image of self-importance. Mm. And for years, I listened to him say that, and I'd be like, what's he talking about? <laughs> what's he talking about? Then I saw this video footage of this thing called the Rouge Test. If you Google the Rouge Test, you'll find it on YouTube. And what they do is they take little kids under 18 months old and they put them in a room with toys and that sort of stuff. And there's a mirror there and the kids are going up to the mirror and going, oh, where's the baby? Where's it? They're looking around and that sort of thing. <laughs> and then they cover up the mirror and put a, a blob of rouge on the child's cheek. And then they reveal the mirror again and the, the kid's still like, where's where's the other kid? Where They're still looking around. They don't realize it's them. Then when they're about 18 months, when they catch sight of themselves in the mirror, they go, they, they, they now have learned that that image over there is the same as them. But up until then, they don't have any conception of an image of self. I think that's what he's talking about. I think that we create that image of self and then we get hypnotized into believing that that's who we are. Like I'm sitting here, we're having this conversation and I can see you on the screen and I'm like, oh yeah, that's Deborah, I recognize her. And you can see me and I, I see me. I'm like, that's Jamie, I recognize him every, anywhere. But you're not that small and flat and neither am I. <laughs> uh, and... And But we've learned that, oh, yeah, that's me, but that's not who you are to yourself, right? Mm -hmm. But we've learned this idea of self, and then we, we start to relate to it and build maps in our heads as though that's who we are. And it just isn't. It just isn't. But, it, but we've been... Look, you ever watch a movie and you get so into the film that something happens to the character and you react. As like, <laughs> well, that's after watching a movie for half an hour. What do you think happens when you're watching the movie for 20, 30, 40 years? You just, you, you think it's you and it's not, that's not you. That's an image. It's an image. It's an image. And who you really are is before and beyond that. And, um, uh, And someone once said to me, who you really are isn't of this world of form. So who you really are can't be harmed or damaged by anything in this world of form. It really did something for me to hear that, you know? That, that was what I heard. That was yeah. what I heard in what you were sharing. It's like, wow. We'd been told, I'd been told that my children would probably learn to cope, but always have, you know, they've got PTSD and all things like this. And they would always carry with them the scars of what had happened and stuff like this. And then hearing that just does not have to be true. That's one possibility, but that just does not have to be true. Because who we truly are can't be permanently damaged in that way. Can't be. It's like when you think of um, a film or a movie, when we think of that and you watch, you, know, you watch it on a screen, most of the time we don't even see the screen. And then, you know, if, if you if there was a war film playing or a love story playing or anything, once that's finished, the screen hasn't changed in any way, no mm. matter what has gone on, no matter what things you've watched. And it's like, yeah, that's kind of who we are, where this is playing out. That can't be damaged or changed or 
nothing happens to that. And no, I'd love everyone to know that. I would love everyone to have a, a felt experience of mm. that. Yeah. I I I know, you know, I I heard you say many, many times, you know, kind of your mission was to get out and to the best of your ability to do that. Um how is how does that feel to you now? And how does that feel like, you know? Well, it's funny, you know. So when I first stumbled across these principles, it was like psychology's best kept secret. Mm. And uh I remember I was at a conference in 2010 in Florida and everyone was saying how difficult it was to get people interested in this stuff. And I was kind of like, hold my beer, hang on a second. <laughs> and and uh, I kind of made it my mission to raise awareness of this understanding. And then maybe five years later, I was at a motorway services in the UK and in the top 10 nonfiction uh, books were my book, Clarity, Chantal Burns' book, Instant Motivation, and Michael Neal's book, uh, Inside Out Revolution. So three principles books in the top 10. Wow. And I was like, oh, okay, phase one is done. <laughs> I've done phase one. And and like if you if you look around now, I mean, in terms of mainstream psychology, it's made hardly a dent, but that's always kind of the last thing to catch up. Uh, awareness and understanding of the principles is reaching more and more people. The internet's making that possible, and I, I, uh, yeah, I mean, it's also been a journey for me, kind of. Uh, discovering my own learning journey with the principles, but also my learn my own journey of kind of uh, having my uh, uh, more uh, uh, egregious personality traits ironed out to some degree and that sort of <laughs> thing. So I kind of, I can look back and go, okay, here are the things I would have done differently and that sort of thing. But I, I feel very, very, you know, I have a life that's beyond my wildest dreams of uh, where I was. Uh, if I go back to um, the life I was living in like the 1990s and stuff, where it was, you know, drinking and, uh, you know, uh, corporate jobs and all that sort of stuff. And now it's whatever it is. Like, so what's that, 26 years later, 27 years later? I've got a life literally beyond my wildest dreams of what I ever, what I even thought might be possible back then. Like I, I, I experience more love and connection in the average day than I used to in the average year, you know, like I, um, I feel so very hopeful for, um, the future and super optimistic despite despite it's funny i was talking to a guy and he i he said jamie you are simultaneously the most pessimistic and the most optimistic person i've ever met <laughs> i'm like i'm like what do you mean he's like well as far as i can tell you think the whole world's falling apart but you seem fine with it i was like well yeah because we've got this incredible understanding we've got uh the knowing of who we really are and and the world might just be going through some uh, growing pains at the moment. Uh, there's a, a quote from D. Ward Hawk, who said something like, uh, humanity is uh, undergoing the biggest transformation in arts, in culture, in science than than it's seen in 400 years. We're, we're stepping into a new age. And, and if that's true, it seems natural to me that there be a few growing pains so uh, <laughs> i'm very very hopeful and optimistic about where this all heads uh, having said that i know there are people who i deeply respect who are nowhere near as hopeful and optimistic as me but maybe that's just my personality <laughs> i think it's a great actually i put out um daily inspirations every single day and the one that went out this morning said something along the lines of 
if I could give you a gift, it would be the gift of optimism because it's so much. I just think it's such a great way to be. And I and I definitely see for me what I've seen around insight and things like that. I mean, they they come definitely that day when I had mine. I I wasn't in a good place or anything, but I definitely see when I am open and in a good place and just hopeful and all of those things, it seems the more I'm open to see, the more that I see. It's kind of like, yeah, you've seen this, we'll give you this as well. Oh, you like that? We'll give you this as well. You like that one? Wait and see what we've got next. And so definitely that optimism about, wow, I just have no idea about the possibility that could unfold next. Mm. And it's just like, I can think something, I can imagine something that is really, really great, but just going to that place of, and wow, I just have no idea what is possible. I, I, I think I think Sid Banks said that optimism is a spiritual gift. And I like that idea. It's like, uh, oh, yeah. it's <laughs> let's yeah. stick with our optimism then. <laughs> yeah. That is beautiful. So. Anyway, I'm aware of the time and that you have other commitments. So um, that's been a beautiful conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here. Um, and if people want to get in touch with you, I mean, I'll find your details and put it below this anyway. But where where can people, what's the best way? For people? All the usual places. You can find me at jamiesmart.com or on all the social platforms, usually on jamiesmart.com or my books are on Amazon. My podcasts are on the podcast network and uh yeah, just always, uh, always happy to hear from people who are uh, looking in this direction. <laughs> yeah, Thanks, were, Deborah. Most gracious when I reached out. So again, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. My 